All right, welcome to Tabula Poetica. <coughs> Tonight we have our last visiting poet in the series. So we have a poet here this evening to do a reading, and then our last events are actually student readings. The undergraduate student reading is on Monday, December 9th at 11 a.m. in Argerus Forum 209. I think it's A, but it might be C. And then our MFA student reading features myself and Allison Bennis White and five of our fantastic MFA poetry students. And that event is on Tuesday, December 10th at 7 p.m. Actually, that's the one in our Juris Forum 209. The undergrad is in Wilkinson Chapel where all the poetry talks have been this fall. As I'm talking with you, why don't you pull out your cell phones and make sure that those are turned off so they don't ring during the reading. I also want to thank some of the people who make Tabula Poetica possible. The greatest supporter is the English department, um, both in terms of financial support to bring the visiting writers to campus and also uh, generosity of spirit and appreciation of poetry. And we have some faculty here this evening, um, including Mildred Lewis, who will be doing the introduction in a minute. <laughs> now you've thrown me off with all the applause. <laughs> Uh, I, so thanks to the English department, both in terms of the official sign-off on the money uh, that brings you these lovely Rice Krispie treats in the back of the room, <laughs> and, and also helps the, the visiting writers out. Uh, if you would like to purchase a book, those are around the corner. The bookstore is here with some copies of Seth Michelson's book. Uh, we are here in Leatherby Libraries. And I want to thank both Charlene Baldwin and um, the rest of the library staff for sharing their space with us this evening. In addition, this fall we had a translation thread going through the Tabula Poetica series, and Seth Michelson tonight is part of that thread. And that means that the Department of Languages is also a great supporter of these translation events. I think that's just about it. Um, so I will turn over the podium to Mildred Lewis from the English Department. Well, welcome. It's glad to see everybody out for this event. I know it's late in the semester and it's a sacrifice, so we all appreciate it. The bare facts are these. Seth Michelson lives in Los Angeles. He has also lived in Baltimore, in Buenos Aires, Helsinki, Montevideo, New York City, and Sydney. Uh, his website mentions that he's enjoyed many jobs, and he has worked as a bouncer, a janitor, a journalist, a limo driver, a pizza maker, and also a professor. As well, uh, we learned this evening that he has been a dishwasher. He holds degrees from the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore and Sarah Lawrence College. He earned a master's degree from in comparative literature from USC, where he's currently teaching and pursuing a PhD by reading poetry in relation to political violence in Latin America, as well as the United States and Spain. He runs the Fringe Poets Reading Series there. You can catch a few episodes on YouTube. I recommend that you do. It's people from the USC community just reading work. Uh, he's also worked as a translator. Dr. Lee has, of course, mentioned that that is a thread for our series this fall. And I believe that the most recent work he has done as a translation of the acclaimed book, El Ghetto, by the Argentinian poet uh, Tamara Kamensan. His poetry has uh, been published in journals across the country, and he's the author of a couple of books, Eyes Like Broken Windows, chat books like Maestro of Brutal Splendor, Kaddish for My Unborn Son, and House in a Hurricane. He mentioned two things that stood out for me, and these come from his poetry, from his poems. Don't celebrate me, toast me, slap my back, sing my name. I want none of it. No acolytes, no namesakes, no groupies. I'm hoping this evening he'll allow us to be just a little bit of a groupie collective as we hear him read. Would you please help me to welcome him? Good evening, everybody. 
thank you for being here. It's a joy to be here at Chapman. Uh, it's a joy to be here in the library, one of my favorite places, one of our great democratic institutions. Um, thank you, Anna, for organizing this, all of the work that goes into it. I've run many a series, and it's tough work. Uh, thank you, Allison, I saw you earlier, for welcoming me into your class and your terrific students. That was a joy. Thanks to all who are here for a double dip, having come to the lecture earlier today. And thanks for you who are hearing me for the first time. Um, Mildred, that was a beautiful introduction. I appreciate it. I have a PhD now. I need to talk to my web designer because that's a little bit dated. Um, so, you know, that's me in the past. Um, we all have past, right? Pero el pasado es el pasado. <laughs> you guys know Mana? Um, so I'm going to read. Do I have to read at the mic, tech people? Can I squeeze? I do. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping I had to read at the mic. Um, I read loudly. So this mic can pick me up. Is that all right? Is the mic still picking me up? Okay. So s that poem that Mildred referenced, thank you for reading my work carefully. I appreciate that. Um, I wrote after winning a prize. And you would think that's a great thing, but poets, Self-flagellating beasts we are. No. Um, it was actually an ideological opposition to prizes in a certain sense. Of course, it's nice and it's great and gratifying and I appreciate being recognized, but uh, it can be very destructive to your work in creating in any genre of writing uh, or any art, really, right? To sort of be self-satisfied. You're finished. Um, and I know that there's a funny-ish claim by Auden who says any poet who wins a prize should be immediately taken outside thereafter and shot, which is kind of funny, but not really funny when we talk about killing poets because of the history right, of violence against my fellow writers. But that's the impulse, right? But I'll, I'll read that poem as a way to kick off with some transition from what Mildred so kindly said. Can you hear me in the back? All right, great. Against praise. Don't celebrate me, toast me, slap my back, sing my name. I only want to work, do my job like you. Who'd be ludicrous enough to differentiate one salmon from the many speckled leapers battering their way upstream? So plan no banquets, no gala balls, send no bouquets of desperate roses. I want none of it, no acolytes, no namesakes, no groupies. Like you, I teach, like you, I, I'm taught, like you, I sing and read and curse and sometimes even vomit too much wine into the street. But who cares? Why all this fuss over a handful of soil? Don't you know? Of course you do. The body's built to disappear. So dance and clack your bones. Like me, you're one more beast, one more skeleton with vocal cords, one more bee with honey dreams, humming as you toil, a buzz with joy and fervor, in love with the garden's bustle, its amber light seen through wet honeycomb. So, one of my favorite couple of lines from New Testament. I know that there's a religious strain to our campus community here, um, whether secular or spiritual or devoutly religious, these lines ring beautifully and I've stolen them for this poem. See if you can hear them. American cliche. His body's skinny but for the horns of cancer bulging from his chest like thorns jutting from the trunk of this older man, a lifelong rose lover. So he waters and whispers to them each morning, his broken body bent to the earth, joyful duty as it blooms into pink, white, red fireworks. After cooing to them, he jumps into his golden cage, motors to work, beep, beep, a two-hour commute he keeps to religiously. He has to or he'll forfeit the job, health insurance, chemotherapy, yet he leaves for work happy, sunlit from within, the silent prayer of roses lingering on his lips, a sweet perfume, smear of nectar on the hummingbird's miraculous beak tip. Like this, he smiles, stuck in traffic, engines and neighbors overheating while he hopes quietly for his roses to be consumed, for a deer or three to descend the hills, drift into his backyard, trampling false limits with soft hooves as noses down they collect fallen petals. 
each a miniature silken feast, communion wafers on famished tongues, a god dissolving into mouths, hungry to taste and see that the earth is good, even strewn as it is with shards, with shattered beauty everywhere. Here's another beauty worker, which is my wife. A love poem of sorts. Emergency medicine. She works at L.A. County Hospital, emergency department. My wife's hands, small white birds, flutter over the new arrival. A child fallen from a rooftop, blood-filled lungs, a shattered face. In my wife's hands, gloveless, dry from constant washing, give off the scent of lemon soap as they enter each wound. By the glare of a sterile lamp, her fingertips shine, healing with conjured light, as if nothing were unfixable. Like this she touches and touches, the small birds gaining speed as they dart, dive, and twist through a pageantry of swift maneuvers. They build an airway from a rubber tube, thread blue sutures into skin, drain the lungs of thick, dark blood, so the heart again can feed. So we're talking about being bilingual, multilingual. I'm going to try to read a heroic crown of sonnets. It's, so a sonnet is 14 lines, right, in English. It's written typically in pentameter, right? It's uh, a 10-syllable line, right, written in typically two quatrains, two four lines, two groups of four lines, and then two tercets, two groups of three lines. So it's 14 lines, eight and six, with a turn in the middle, right? So a crown of sonnets is where the last line of the first sonnet becomes the first line of the second sonnet. The last line of the second becomes the first of the third, right? And you can typically, a crown could be seven sonnets. So the seventh last line is the first line of the first. So it becomes a crown, a circle, right? It's a cycle. There's also a full crown, which is 14 sonnets that interact like that. So the seventh last line becomes the first line of the eighth, and so on, right? Until the 14th sonnet's last line is the first line of the first of the 14 poems. And then there's a heroic crown of sonnets where all of those first lines become a 15th poem, which is just first lines together. And that's what I've tried to write. It's a heroic crown of sonnets. It's 15 interlaced sonnets, testing the limits of poetic form on the theme, uh, tripartite theme, of my wife's immigration from Argentina during uh, the genocide there, um, of the disappearance of a young woman, 19-year-old, a lot similar in age to many of you, uh, who was pamphleteering at most, not a militant activist, who was disappeared and killed. Um, and then at the same time, right, as my wife is leaving. And then also uh, some, an one summer I went to Argentina and stayed, didn't want to stay with family, so I rented a room in an apartment, and it turned out to be a room in the apartment of uh, a war criminal. So a man who was later held accountable for crimes against humanity, incarcerated, and died in prison. Um, and unknowingly, I spent time living with him before I gradually away. This is called The Crown for Sonia. Sonia Beatriz Gonzalez is the 19-year-old girl who worked in a swift refrigerator factory uh, and was murdered. So it's a crown for Sonia. It's bilingual Spanish. The first poem, I'll tell you, a tiros de bala means gunshots. Milicos is a, s a term for people in the military, but not a nice one if you use it in a certain way. Or it can be friendly, right? But it's a pejorative. Um, con sus pibes. Pibes is this Argentine slang for little kids, with your kids. Um, una brava científica. Brava means strong, ferocious, tenacious, right? Brave. Científica, right? Cognates. It's a scientist. Um, suegro is a father-in-law. And a desaparecido is a disappeared person. And sadly, these are not uh, intrinsic to Argentine culture. They're reference to desaparecidos all over the world. Um, and in Argentine culture, it refers to the 30,000 people who disappeared from 76 to 83 during the genocide there. Being a desaparecido meant you were disappeared. You were kidnapped, tortured, murdered, and your body disposed of. They've recovered about 12,000 of the estimated 30,000 bodies. So people are still mourning specters today, not knowing what happened right, to their friends and loved ones. So that's a desaparecido. My wife's family fled Argentina 
a tiros de bala, los milicos firing shots at them, bullets sizzling past their ears. I see the family, five in all, two parents con sus pibes, ran in tears. Death be not proud. My wife was nine, her siblings littler. Behind they left a dog, ferns unwatered, plates in the sink stuffed, animals forever silent on children's beds, forever. Here now my wife's mother, una brava científica, teaches cowgirls to swap shotguns for lives in cancer research. Y mi suegro, a scientist too, plays Bach on piano, explaining note by note, yo no fui un desaparecido. Pausing long enough to explain, no, yo no fui un desaparecido, the white-haired man in Buenos Aires slides a photograph across the table. A young woman, 19, his only child, smiles up at me. 76, a peace rally, she's an activist, soon disappeared. Snatched from campus after French class, on her way to study physics, raped and tortured, he says, his voice steady, though I watch his lips tremble as he speaks. And I want to fall down in tears, beat the air with my puny fists, but not him. He looks through me, teaches me how to grieve, the sun burning with white fire each day, all year. The sun burns white despite the season, despite today's gray frigid sky, despite the dead leaves scraping the sidewalk like the scattered bones of a lost body. And listless, always listless, the memories of the disappeared, an old man tells you of his missing daughter, her gap-toothed smile, her dark green eyes, how her pretty clothes hung in her closet until they crumbled, fell like ash, and how he searched for her, bounced through churches, barracks, courts, swamps, and prisons, forever luckless, forever empty, seeking a ghost, a blank, a cipher. Everywhere I go, I think I see her. Here she is, he tells me, stabbing a thumb into his chest, the signal global as a wave goodbye, a tired sigh, a blown kiss. She's also here, he explains, offering up another photo, a windswept shore, a choppy delta, its water red from clay upstream. Here, he says, a secret caller once said I'd find my daughter's corpse, said he'd tossed her there from an airplane, Colonel's Orders 76, said he bound her wrists with plastic wire, sealed her mouth with duct tape. I searched for her that very day, pero nada. Was she a liar? At night, if I sleep, I see her falling, hear her silent screams. I see her falling, hear her screams. Sonia Beatriz Gonzalez, this fleshless woman, conjured form, forever falling, robed in flame. She's a meteor of the mind, a drug racing my brain's groove circuit. Always this thought, this viral question, who do you cry out to when being taken? And what did it feel like to be surprised by a hand slapped across your mouth, another punching your kidneys, four more wrangling your kicking feet? Did you hear your purse smash to the sidewalk, a skull spilling out its contents, your life strewn across this street where I now stand in heavy rain. In this morning's heavy rain, I went out to walk alone, barefoot in shorts, no shirt. Forgive me, Sonia, but I wanted to feel like you, exposed, impossible, I know, and stupid. They whipped and starved you, kept you caged, broke your nose and teeth, forced objects between your legs, then in. Did you beg for mercy in the harshest moments? or talk to yourself, that last mad solace. Sonia, I'm sorry. We fail and fail. We kill flies without thinking. We cut flowers from wild gardens, display their heads on our coffee tables. Sonia, I love you. Why is that so crazy? Can't a hawk love the formless breeze? A hawkish breeze caught the country. People fled, got rich or perished. Not you, you dreamt of justice, spoke of water pooled deep and clean within you. You said we each were a ripened star fruit, thick bumpy hides around lustrous goodness. You said we tortured out of confusion, like frenzied sharks gone stupid. But then your speech slurred to shouts, to pleas, to screams. Sometimes all we're left with is a hoarse voice, wordless after being beaten silly. But even then we cry out, 
for help to be killed, sound itself becoming force, our final resistance, its absence the only sound we dare never to hear. Now no one wants to hear about it, not professors, not high school teachers, not poets, cops, or trash men, not cooks in church kitchens. No one here wants to hear of Sonia, a girl snatched right off the street, banished an urban phantom since 1976. I get it. They don't need to know the details to understand. A secret order for dispatched killers, Sonia dead before being taken. So why discuss her? It won't soothe pain, heal her parents, build trusting citizens, all of whom must endure like apples on a scraggly tree with dry, twisted roots. How's this for twisted? I know Sonia's killer. I lived with him one winter. He was my host in Buenos Aires, assigned by chance to house and feed me. For dinner, he'd boil water, then with cramped arthritic hands drop in hot dogs one by one, ever careful to avoid painful splashes. Then he'd smile straight at me from behind a screen of vapor, the air pungent with boiling meat, his mustache damp with condensation. Readied, he'd stab the Franks from pot to plate with chilling grace, and I'd accept, stunned, and eat. I once ate six straight to avoid having to speak. As I chewed, I could hear Sonia scream. My stomach knots when I hear Sonia, alone and naked in a cage. Any teen, she must have disbelieved her final moment was edging near. And it wasn't. It was already over. All is past, like these lines you're reading. They have no present, just a future, composed of bodies piled up with Sonia's. Don't you see? We're the prison. It stones our flesh. So what is freedom? For Sonia, the word means nothing. Nada. Zero. Zilch. I know. I'm sick. I lived with her killer. He drenched, he drenched me one winter morning in death's blue-eyed gaze. Each morning, we shared croissants for breakfast. What does it mean that I munch croissants each morning with a torturer? The two of us had his breakfast nook, sun-splashed, cozy. He was so polite. We filled my coffee, passed me napkins when I'd sneeze, though those same hands once clenched Sonia by her throat. He used her hair like a horse's bridle, dragged her kicking to an idling car, shoved her face first into its trunk. Her family left forever, wondering, Oh, Sonia, what I didn't know. Oh, Sonia, please forgive me. Forgive each croissant I buttered, each morning so joyful, the doy now burning in my throat like vomit, filling my eyes with tears. My eyes burn with pride when I call my wife who's safe at home in the States. A physician, she tells me she's just saved a human life. A man, late 60s, overweight, with chest pain, collapsed. A heart attack in the hospital cafeteria. Code red. My wife went running, face flushed, her short legs pumping. But he was blue when she arrived. No pulse, no breathing. So she started CPR, rushed him by gurney to her station, where she shocked him, injected drugs, forced oxygen down his throat. Like this, she cradled his fragile heart until it pumped again on his own. I sing this as a prayer for Sonia, her body somewhere waiting slumped over. Her missing body may not be found, will not be found, cannot be found, not now, not ever, a pile of ash like a silenced campfire. All that remains to be known is her end, some final witness, he who will say she died quickly, never afraid, forever singing. Or I'll speak of milicos like vultures circling Sonia, gagged and naked, her body chained to a prison table, their shadows ghosting across her face as they plied her with brutal questions. They used the cattle prod, he weeps, but she died in silence, ni un grito, the only sound the sizzle of electricity. The sizzle of electricity in my plastic desk lamp reminds me I'm not alone as I sit here reading alone in my Los Angeles study. Spirits course through this living world like blood through a healthy brain. It's 8 a.m. and in the next room my wife's just home from a grueling night shift. 
She came in splattered in gore, her pale blue scrubs a polyp canvas. That's gross, you're thinking, and miss the beauty? How my wife endures it in silence each day to save. Your mom, neighbor, paramour, sweet grandpa Louis, who'll all, who'd all be dead now were they born Sonia, or had my wife not fled Argentina. My wife's family fled Argentina without pausing to explain. The sun burned white that frigid morning. Y aquí están, still here with us. If you see them falter, hear their night screams, remember death strikes like sudden rain, a cold breeze that, cr that frosts the countryside, and no one could have foreseen it. How's that for twisted? Worse, we all know killers, Sonia's and others. My stomach knots with the thought. I munch croissants with whom? But I also burn with pride when I call my wife or think of Sonia's fierce bravery, their defiance, a spark in darkness, hope, electricity. It's a long one to read, but thank you for listening. I'm going to read some new stuff. So my new book is filled with manifestos because my older stuff wasn't angry enough. So I've got a lot of poetic manifestos that I interposed with lyrics, light, <laughs> lyrical, philosophical, metacritical reflections on language, and then these narratives, these manifestos. And uh, let's see. Victor Jara is a great Chilean musician uh, and poet. And he was killed um, by the Pinochet dictatorship. They took him to Estadio de Chile where they tortured him because he was a famous and admired um, guitarist and a figure of resistance to fascism. They broke his fingers, right? As a cruel and a sort of, just to brutalize him, right? Torment him in, in the moments before his death. So he's a great guitar player. One more indignity, right? A little bit more pain. So this is called Venceremos, which means we will win. Maybe we will overcome as a great anthem, right, of civil rights. It's called Venceremos, a manifesto. And a lot of these are going to be the same title, colon, a manifesto, right? So this is Venceremos, colon, a manifesto. They snapped your fingers one by one, pain exploding from each knuckle till agony, only the agony of your hand was real and present. All that remained was the echo of bones snapped, and crooked fingers, in pain like snakes set on fire, a butterfly stitched alive into a collector's book, and you writhing, Victor Jara, one more specimen cut among the many, pinned down here to die amid the thousands being club kicked and shot all around you in Estadio Chile, oh, civic cathedral of Santiago, where the comandante leans in close to your ear and rasps, you'll never again strum or sing, Victor, at least not here in this world, traitor as if a storm of slurs and mangled fingers and crazy bullets could kill a song. Here's one. I was talking with your intrepid organizer, Anna, about head injuries in football. This one's called Football, colon, a manifesto. Of course, in a game like this of bone-cracking collisions, the brain, too, would be perturbed. Yellow jello shaken in a too-big tupper until it turns to watery soup. So it is that these headfirst warriors are a lot like childhood you, true believers, born again and again by forgetting. Memory loss, the signature in disappearing ink of a life of chronic concussions. Punch drunk comes to mind a brain befogged by constant violence, the hits in football more steel wrecking ball than brief human entanglement. So these men believe, must believe, in God as protector, as shield, as extra padding for a body sore from wallopings and wind sprints. And we in the States believe, at least 64% of us, that this is the apex of entertainment. 11 men in shiny red and 11 more in dull silver lining up to await the signal to scramble one another's brains? 
the money in it, in the oodles, turning water to wine, in the goblets of team owners who, in TV interviews, after the big one, toast their coaches, kiss crystal trophies, and pat, pat the backs of their, of their bruised glutes, who brain mashed celebrate too, spritzing the room with champagne as they babble to interviewers about their belief in teamwork and in God, to whom they give thanks each and every day, feeling blessed as they do, that he loved them so much, he created them as neat. How about another? Blindness. This is in Tab, your wonderful journal that I love to read. Blindness, colon, a manifesto. <laughs> this is Jose Saramago, right? Great Portuguese novelist, Nobel Prize winner. Saramago was blind, or his characters were, to the invisibility of justice, the way a living hand, so warm and capable, braces your shoulder when the subway jerks. How everyone stumbles, a jumbled mash of staggered strangers, of sheepish thank yous, the air bright with sudden kindness. It buzzes through the wagons as they resume their screechy pull for the next station for platforms as yet unseen, but surely out there, somewhere, soon to take form, the way clouds go hear their beauty from the nothingness. And Saramago, or at least his characters, they can't trust in such inexplicable materialization not without seeing it firsthand. So they beat their heads with rocks till their foreheads bleed, and they gouge at their eyes with their own thumbs till all they see is white pain. Lives auto-erased, the invisible world stripped of hope and possibility, so they throw themselves naked into icy lakes and pitch themselves headlong off seaside cliffs, desperate to find and feel all that can't not be left unfelt, unseen. Shift tone a little bit. How about this one? This one's called Sloppy Seconds. Colon, a werewolf manifesto. <laughs> Let's get the werewolves in here. Come on now. Where are my werewolves at? Um, sloppy Seconds, a werewolf manifesto. It's so hard to work on Wall Street, winds the werewolf to his wife over a glass of chilled Chablis in their Tribeca kitchen. She nods, serves him another oven-roasted pig ear, adds, they're sprinkled with brown sugar, just the way you like them. But as if alone, lost in some messianic vision, he ignores her and staring out, continues his whimper. I wanted the short sell Malaysian gold, but my boss, the dumb beast, insisted we speculate in Africa on drug patents in Botswana and hospitals, where he swears if we lean on the courts enough, we'll make a killing. At this, his wife grasps her duty and drops softly to her knees, coos, there, there, big daddy, and unzips him. And soon he's pumping hard from behind her hips, sweat rising through his back fur, his pork breath hot in her ear as he pants delirium, at which point she turns on him, flash of tooth, and rips out his throat just as any decent beast should. How about a poem of advice for you all, young writers, young people, but written to my sons. My sons are three and five. Ilan Sebastian is five, and Joaquin is three, little Kimiko. I had it marked, I apologize. May your sorrows not abandon you. May your sorrows not abandon you. For my sons and for you young people. When the last space shuttle left the stratosphere, the final exit of fire, of roaring, shaking metal, a trail of smoke, it was then I learned that the hurts and the smoke, like this morning graveside, Bearing the father of my dearest friend, how our bodies plummeted, deserted, as we watched the casket lowered. A final exit, fire and smoke, 
the cantor drenching our pain in song, and, oh, my sons, may your sorrows never abandon you, not even the fiercest blows when you'll bellow loss and cough up bones, a self coming apart in pieces, in roaring, shaking terror, as you moan song-like the scalding truth that we lose often and in agony, but in the loss find ways to live. So when I say look out for pain, when I say look at and through it, what I really mean is you must learn to feed on smoke. I'm going to try out a we have time. I think I'll read three more poems. And thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you being here. It's a joy for me to be with you. Even where the tables were reversed, I love to listen. So it's also nice to read. This one is for a friend of mine who was beaten up, gay bashing. She's a petite lesbian. It's called trilingual, going back to our translation, multilingualism, trilingual queer love song, colon, I manifest it. It's also got Spanish and other languages. Just go with what you understand. Yeah. Hopefully context helps. Tonight it hits me, y de repente a mí, struck by acid understanding. Assimilation es una trampa de los devotos de la ausencia. I mean, quien de nosotros would lust wildly for her own disappearance? We must speak nuestras lenguas or cease to exist, correcto? So our tongues flicker trip over linguistic borders, spitting blue-green fire with the crazed fury of what the gods would be if they weren't lost in myth of homogeneity, that bad translation of our mosaic lives, minds, and bodies, our forests of ash, hickory, and beech, hacked to bits and sold as firewood. The violence of enforced uniformity, la cosa que más me da miedo. Why else would young gay men jump from presidential bridges when instead they could be safe at home playing violin for a wine-drunk boyfriend until neither man can resist the impassioned, thrusty bowing in a shirt's unbuttoned, a breast bared for a tongued arpeggio with staccato moans? M'entendez, mon hypocrite lecteur? Mon semblable, mon frere, I'm the dark matter of the senses, exploding into starlight. These are Spanglish queer outlaw love songs, cantadas por los hombres necios, and for my sons, and for my neighbor, the closeted Baptist preacher, who, like many, thinks men are beautiful, but fools to live as couples, their lives un estilo de vida, a lifestyle, and a sinful one at that. Such is the singularity of his puto de vista, you feel me, mis compañeros? I want to whisper into his narrow ear canal, deja de joder, boludo, or better yet, dejalos joder y en paz. Let them make love. I'm just trying my damnedest here to say leave us be. Perform your exorcisms elsewhere, like in the confessional booth of your locked bathroom, where alone, gone preverbal loco, you'll pull out a razor blade and slash your heart to bits in an attempt to excise its impurities, though all you'll end up with is a wasted razor blade and two bloody hands, both empty. Entonces, mis queridos, mis compatriotas from the land beyond absence, remember this, we exist and will conform, but only if necessary, to duck a back alley beating, a schoolyard bully, to avoid being tied to a rural fence by, by escapees from cathedrals of hatred, and instead will appeal to grocery store saints, blessed dogs, PTA moms, and the prismatic genius of our own magnificent multitudinous bodies, such that when you, a grown person, find yourself crouched with fear in a homophobic bar, or worse, like my pal Viju, thrown into a brick wall by a drunk bigot, yes, even there, bloodied, your teeth chipped, mind skittering, you'll be strong enough to close your eyes, inhale deeply, and begin to sing. Um. 
It's called Strange How We Can Walk. And actually, I'm going to close with one poem after this, and then esa varara, no venus. I'll sign books if you'd like a book signed. If you'd like to afflict your friends with poetry. That roommate who annoys you. Right? Read this, friend. I bought it just for you. Look, it's signed to your name. It's like coal, right, as a stocking stuffer. <laughs> Strange how we can walk, and it's got a jam title, too. Strange how we can walk. Strange how we can walk. It's for a friend who got diagnosed with aortic stenosis. It's a l basically, it's a leak in his heart because of narrowing. Strange how we can walk into new light each morning, same city, same sidewalk, but also somehow change. Like this daybreak, late May in downtown LA, where you're walking your city block, face washed in white flame. And as the birds sing their staccato, you mull yesterday's news. Aortic stenosis, your heart, sir, is leaking. So you become, in this morning's light, a wandering opacity, a blanked out human figure whose edges ripple with flame. The sun shoots down and through you, strikes the tiny green leaves, just now budding from a crack in the broken sidewalk beneath you. It's as if they're too shy to exist, could emerge only where overlooked, much like you in this scorched instant of bald self-recognition, that you're a life fading, being drained, erased as you live, light leaking into light, your life a pasture going up in flames, and the heat forcing you to call out, how can I endure? What mercy in being? How porous the human form, and how much ravishment can a single ramshackle heart bear? Thank you again for listening. Here's my last poem tonight we'll end on. It's called Belly Folds. Let's let end with a little laughter, hopefully. Belly Folds. The pale flab that hangs over the sharp edge of your belt. The sweaty rolls that rumble when you eat bad fish stew. The only spot on your body where boneless skin chafes boneless skin. The creases in which lives your outermost shame. And sure, they're sad reminders of gravity's constant work, taking you down alive. And sure, they're embarrassing to follow into rooms, i.e. restaurants, nightclubs, weddings, and class reunions. And certainly, they're the loneliest stretch of self, so rarely caressed and even more rarely kissed. But those flesh hills, so gentle, are sown with hair as soft as summer grass. And they mark you a sensualist, one who follows the mouth to pleasure. Moreover, what sights better than their wild concussive jiggles when laughter explodes the buried heart. Thank you very much, you guys. It's been a joy. Great question. Um, so I rented a room, right, um, because I didn't have enough grant money. I was doing research on poets who wrote against the resistance and principally one whose son was murdered because he escaped the country, a, a man named Juan Kelman. He's a great poet. You should all read. He's great. Um, very powerful writer. So when Kelman when they couldn't catch him, they murdered his son, Marcelo, and his daughter-in-law, who was pregnant. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought waving to my new unknown friend. Um, and <laughs> I'm sorry. So I was doing research on them, and I didn't have enough money to buy my own room, and I didn't want to stay with family because that obligates you to like four or five lunches a day, and each lunch is two to three hours, and right? lots of mate. And, um, so I uh, rented a room, and... I met the wife of the man in a cafe, and we went back to their apartment together. And I thought it odd that he weren't there, um, but she explained he wasn't well physically. And so we got back, and we entered through their kitchen door, which is common. It's actually warm way to welcome someone as opposed to the front door, and it's warm. Um, 
we had a snack in the kitchen. I told him what I was doing. Uh, hey, I'm here to study these poetry, poetries of resistance to state violence. And they kind of just nodded off like so many people do when I start talking about poetry. <laughs> so I didn't think anything of it. Um, and then I was shown to my room, and on way to the room, uh, there were plaques on the wall in the hallway, um, sort of for things that would say, like, the equivalent of, for your, for your honor honorable service, you know, in the years where 79 to 80, and 80 to 81, and years, and it said he was a colonel, right? So in the pecking order, the hierarchy, he was just below the generals, for those of you who might not know. And... Uh, I was nervous because there's no way to be that empowered, right, within the military and be a pacifist or humanitarian or egalitarian. Um, there's a certain degree of culpability, right, or at least complicity. Um, and so I started to do research. I was frightened. Um, I found his name in a registry, Human Rights Watch registry. I had friends who were lawyers, civil rights lawyers, and uh, through investigation and working with a group of activists, lawyers, journalists, writers, intellectuals, uh, I learned the identity of this person who uh, was subsequently incarcerated and said in his only statement in trial that in typical indignant fashion, right, that he didn't do anything, he says, excesos de la guerra, Excesses of war, maybe, but that's to be expected. Um, and so, for his non-compliance, a person of his age was given, typically would have been given, um, house incarcerations. Right? But but they put him in prison for not testifying uh, because he had access. He was working under uh, a very ruthless general, and he had been get empowered to set up a lot of clandestine detention centers for torture and murder sites. Um, and we have personal familial right, connections to the suffering and loss and or n almost, I mean everyone does in Argentina and, uh, and also sort of an, a shocking uh, experience and, and I felt a natural commitment right, to bringing out this, uh, this story. And so I learned more and more details of what he did and there's there's been testimony about certain things. They've had, like in South Africa, like a zero hour, a justice for the truth, um, where they try to, at first they were offered Im uh, immunity uh, for testifying in front of a cadre of judges and giving information so that we could assuage some people's suffering, right, not knowing what happened to their loved one. Uh, but then that was, their immunity was overturned and then these people started to get prosecuted and he's the person who got prosecuted and um, ended up dying in jail. It's very sad directly responsible for uh, many deaths, probably in the thousands, in terms of participating in structural violence. I wrote The Crown thinking about ways that um, form is both entrapping and liberating, right? The rigidities of form, fascistic adherence to a form that demands that you write 15 poems interlaced in such a complicated way There are points in there where I break the rhyme scheme intentionally. Um, I think of them as sort of forms of metacritical critique of the language of right, fascistic adherence to, to form. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very sad time. And it's a beautiful adaptation by a great uh, composer, uh, Tian Zhu, and he set um, some of the, the sonnets to I guess operatic music. It's a soprano and a cello and a piano. It's on my website, sethmichelson.com, if you want to listen. And um, that's been very gratifying for people to f who are still suffering those losses, those open wounds, those unhealed wounds, those irreparable wounds until we can find bodies in a sense, right? Like how can you leave the dead that you can't recover or confirm? But the music has meant a lot to certain people and so have the poems and maybe there's some small solace in that, but it's a very difficult topic. So the poet Stephen Dunn said, everything is true at some point in the 24-hour day, <laughs> right? Um, 
and I think I feel similarly. Um, I'm a variable creature like the rest of us, and uh, my fascinations range, and uh, I'm not sure. That was written for a friend who was feeling chagrin about being overweight, and I thought, are you serious? Um, of all the things to be ashamed of, right? We have such deeper shames, don't we, right? Um, <laughs> let's not be sidetracked by the superficial. <laughs> let's get down to the real agony. Um, no, so I wrote that poem, right? Because there's something beautiful about a deep belly chuckle, right? Which can be amplified by girth, right? Yeah. I don't know about wisdom, but I can offer some advice, and you can sort of judge for yourselves. Um, I would say read till your brain hurts, right? Um, read widely, deeply, recklessly, and most importantly, slowly, right? Nothing is radical in reading slowly, right? Pouring over the text meticulously, fastidiously, right? Um, memorize poetry, right? Um, take it by heart if you can. Um, I would say write exhaustively, right? As much as you can, right? When you're not reading, but you should definitely be doing more reading than writing. Um, I would also say connect with other writers of various uh, levels of achievement and ability and uh, interest and genre uh, because that's nourishing and necessary. Let's not uh, sort of falsely or prematurely entrap ourselves by genre. Maybe never should we entrap ourselves by genre. I remember I once was told, and I was so excited to start studying poetry in college, I'd waited my whole life. But I had a degenerative, I have a degenerative hip disease, so I couldn't do PE. I was telling some of our reporter and some of our friends here tonight. So from second grade on, I was taken to kindergarten during PE, and I'd teach phonics and reading and stuff to kindergartners, right? And so I sort of learned to take pleasure in a communicative act and language um, as a bridge, as a, a conduit of um, opportunities to connect with others deeply, joyfully. Um, And when I got to college, this professor in the introductory poetry workshop, when I was talking about, oh, and I also had to write this story, said, you can't write both. You can't write both. You have to work in one genre. Which is, wow. Maybe true for some people. But I would never discourage anyone from writing anything. It's like people who are against, you know, Harry Potter. Why are they always reading? I'm just glad they're reading, right? You should always be reading and writing. Um, and so advice, in short, read till your brain hurts. Write exhaustively, share, build networks, right, amongst yourselves. Build networks across time with the ghosts of your favorite writers, the writers you despise. You can learn from everything. A great poet said you could read from learning the dictionary, right? You can read uh, Chinese takeout menus and learn, right, as a writer, certain tropes, certain functions of language, what's persuasive, appealing, convincing, charismatic, disinteresting, right, repugnant. What does a typo do? Everything from the superficial to the profound, right? Um, and I encourage that. I'm open, available. If you want to contact me, you can get to me through my website um, or through Anna. Um, stick by her. Stick by Allison, Hilda. Right? Stick together. Um, it's hard, solitudinous, right? frustrating work. Um, and we need one another. Um, support other writers. Buy their books. Um, buy their CDs, whatever media they work in as artists. Go to local artists' events. I don't know. There's an endless list. But just um, read and write, right, is I guess the key. And talk for a long time when asked a simple question. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure, guys. Thank you. <laughs>